Good morning all. This is a supplementary episode to my PIC microcontroller assembly language tutorials. So in part one I covered uh, a bit about the programmer, the IDE, the Integrated Development Environment, and uh, the chip itself, mainly about the configuration bits and the clock. Now what's uh, come up in the comments, and also prior to that um, tutorial, is that people would like to know the circuit, the schematic, for this board so that they can make up uh, their own board uh, on VeraBoard or BreadBoard or something like that. So let's look at the schematic of this board first today. So to draw the schematic, I want these five signals. Well, they're uh, VDD ground, they're not really signals. VPP, that's the programming voltage, but it's also used to reset the chip. And then you've got program data and program clock. So let's draw that uh, six pin, but only five pins are used, connector onto a schematic. So I'm drawing my schematic on page two of the data sheet because uh, on that page there is a diagram of the uh, PIC 12F675, this bottom one here. And we can pick off these signals. We've got VDD, VSS, uh, ICSP DAT, of course that's PG data. ICSP clock, that's PGC, PG clock, and VPPs down here. So all I need to do is link these points to the various chip pins. Let's do that now. So fairly obviously, uh, VDD goes to VDD. Uh, ground goes to VSS. Uh, D goes to ICSP DAT. C goes to ICSP clock. And VPP goes to, well, I'm going to run it down here to uh, VPP, pin 4. But it only does that after you fit the wire mod. So here's the wire mod. Cut the track up in this corner of the board next to the pot, which cuts the VPP line. And on the underside, link that VPP line down to the GP3 pin on the chip. There is a link directly across there on the top of the board. Now previously, they had VPP connected to the outside of this link here, so that you could take that link off and disconnect, well, the programmer VPP pin from the chip. There's absolutely no point in doing this, that. If you really want to disconnect the programmer, just pull it off the connector like I've done there. So after you've fitted this wire mod to the inside of that little header pin, you end up with this. The five signals go directly to the chip. And for me, that makes the most sense. And uh, here's a separate diagram showing the chip and the eight links, these eight yellow links on the board, and where they go in terms of the peripheral devices. Now, one thing to point out is that the links for VSS and VDD are permanently connected. So even if you remove the little yellow plastic link, it doesn't break that line because that would be pretty daft to break VDD and VSS. So really these aren't so much links as sort of connection points where you can pick off ground and VDD. Now the rest are all break links and they work as follows. There are LEDs 1 and 2 on GP0 and GP1. Uh, they're all marked on here. These are actually marked LED1, LED2. Uh, these are anode to VDD with a 1K resistor. So uh, when you connect them up to the chip and you put a low on these two pins, then these LEDs will light up. They're kind of inverse logic. On GP2, which is also called key one on the board, there it is, key one. You've got a key pulling down to ground. That's one of these tactile switches. You've got a 10K resistor pulling up to VDD. On the other side is exactly the same. Key 2 is actually up here on GP5 if you link it. 10K pull up to VDD and the switch pulling down to ground. On GP4, which is marked as ADC, analog to digital converter, although of course you can put the analog to digital converter on more than just this pin, there is the pot, this blue pot up here. It's a 10K, the wiper goes to this pin so that you can measure the voltage on the wiper. Uh, one side, of course, is connected to VDD, the other side to ground. And on GP3, which also doubles up as the reset or master clear line, uh, 
there's simply a capacitor. Now I don't know the value because it's a surface mount and there's no value marked on it and a 10K pull up to VDD. So that's the circuit for all the peripherals. And this is the circuit for the way the uh, programmer connector connects to the chip pins after you've made my wire mod to connect VPP directly to pin four of the chip. So if you're making up a chip on a breadboard and all you really want to do is program the chip, it's actually pretty straightforward. You just need this six pin connector. Uh, you can use a standard 0.1, in, 0 .1 inch header connector. Now remember that the little arrow on the programmer is actually here. It's the VPP pin. I suppose that's called pin one. Uh, that goes down to the VPP pin on the chip. Uh, the rest is relatively straightforward. If you use page two of the data sheet, you can fairly easily identify on the chip, which is VDD, which is ground, which is ICSP DAT, and which is ICSP clock, just five wires. Now, the other thing that came up a lot in the comments was about calibrating the internal four megahertz oscillator. You can see that FOSC over four is reading 1.18 megahertz. Uh, actually, I just need to say at this point, an honorable mention to Daniel Roybear, who came up with the genius idea of putting red insulation tape over the digits of the uh, seven segment displays. And even without my light blocking thing, you can read that now in pure daylight. I don't have to shield it. So uh, thanks, Daniel. That's absolutely brilliant. Now, I said in part one of this tutorial that I'd erased this chip and therefore erased the calibration value that sits uh, in the very last location of program memory and which is put in there by microchip when they uh, ship this product. Well, it turns out that I hadn't erased it. So then I thought, oh, well, I better be true to my word and actually erase it. So in the IDE, I did a chip erase, but that still didn't erase it. So I've got a funny feeling that the IDE knows that this chip has that value in the very last location and actually protects it. I think probably what it does is it reads it out, erases the chip and then writes it back in. It's actually quite clever. So here in the IDE, I've got my config program, which just sets up uh, the internal four megahertz oscillator as the clock source. This was hexadecimal three FF five. Now what I'm gonna do is go to view and look at the program memory and look at the very last location in memory. Now it shows three FFF, and that's because I haven't actually read the chip. So let's go up here to the second of these programmer controls, and it is read the target device memory. So let's do that. And now you can see in the program memory window, what pops up in the very last location, uh, it's address, well, decimal, one, no, line 1024, decimal, uh, Sorry, hexadecimal address is 3FF, 03FF. And the opcode is a return with a literal in W with the value 2C. So 2C hexadecimal is actually the value that will calibrate my 4 megahertz internal oscillator. Now it's written here as 34 2C because th the 34 bit is the opcode, which is a return with a literal in W. So just going back to the data sheet for the moment, we've got this section here, 9251, calibrating the internal oscillator. A calibration instruction is programmed into the last location of program memory. This instruction is a return with a literal in W, XX, where the literal, XX, is the calibration value. And uh, this literal value has to be placed in the OSCCAL register. And they give you a little code snippet here, which I'm gonna program in now to pull this calibration value out of the last location of memory, 3FF hexadecimal, and put it in OSCCAL. There are a couple of complications. OSCCAL is in the high bank, the high register bank, so we have to switch to the high register bank. Now I'll cover this in part two, but let's just get this in, get that calibration value into OSCCAL, and see if this, oh, why's that gone to zero? Uh, that's better to see if this frequency goes to exactly one megahertz.
Right, I've written the uh, code snippet in, it's just this. Um, I've used numbers rather than names, so I don't have to use an include. I've put it at uh, origin zero, so it's at the beginning of program memory. So that it doesn't uh, just flow through unprogrammed memory, I've put a, a label in here, lockup, go to lockup, so it'll just stick at this point and do nothing more. But this should put the calibration value into register 90, which is OSC cal, and we should calibrate the oscillator. So if I go up here and program the chip, let's see what happens. Interesting result. Yeah, that is quite interesting because that has not actually calibrated very precisely. Uh, that's come up as 989 kilohertz. So I wonder if we could tweak the calibration value up or down one and uh, see what the result would be. So from the program memory window, I can see that the OSC cal value that's programmed into the chip is 2C, it's an 8-bit value. Now if I, instead of calling this uh, subroutine which pulls that value out of that last loca in mem location in memory, if I just put a 2C in and then try, I don't know, a 2B or a 2D, see if we can tune this oscillator to exactly uh, 4 megahertz and therefore 1 megahertz at the output. So let me just make that change. So what I've done is I've put the value 2B into W and then moved that out into register 90, which is OSC cal. And the result is... Well, it's actually gone down. I think that was 989 and uh, it's now 979. So now maybe if I put the value 2D into OSC cal, this will be just about bang on. Let's give it a try. So there it is. Uh, put the value 2D into W and then put it out into OSC cal. Let's see what that does. Project quick build. Succeeded and program the chip. And the result is... Well, that's interesting. Uh, 2D was no better than 2C. Neither was 2E nor 2F. So I've actually gone up to 30 now, and that's given me a better result. Sorry, 3-0 hexadecimal. And that's resulted in 999.5 uh, kilohertz. So just a fraction under the 1 megahertz. Uh, now I can try going up to 31 and then that will probably go over one mug here. So let's just actually do that. Well, that's interesting. I actually had to go up to 34 hexadecimal to get this to move. So I'm just wondering whether the two least significant bits of that calibration value aren't actually used at all. So with 34, I've got 1.009 megahertz coming out of GP4. Remember that's the oscillator divided by 4. So the oscillator, the internal oscillator, is now running at just over 4 megahertz. Interesting. So that begs the question, why didn't the calibration value that was given, which was 2C, why didn't that result in exactly 4 megahertz? Well, there's this up here about the internal 4 megahertz oscillator. See the electrical specifications section 12 for information on variation over voltage and temperature. Now, Arizona microchip, is that in Arizona? Is it a bit hotter there? It's quite possible when this thing was calibrated, it was done at a different temperature. It's uh, 20 degrees in the room here at the moment. That's probably a pretty normal temperature. But yes, temperature and voltage variations can affect the frequency of the internal oscillator. So I've had to tweak that number a bit to get it exactly right. Now, Nicholas Barnes asked about the advantages and disadvantages of the various clock sources. So let's quickly go through that. Uh, the crystal oscillator is very fast. You can go up to 20 megahertz. It's also very precise. So if your timing requirements need to be really very precise, use a crystal. What's the downside? Well, if you're running all the CMOS logic inside this chip at 20 megahertz, it's going to use more energy because CMOS circuitry uh, uses energy when you charge the MOSFET gates and discharge them. So in other words, when you switch the circuits, when CMOS uh, logic is in its standby state of not moving, it uses almost no energy at all. So high uh, 
current high power usage is the disadvantage of the crystal oscillator. Actually, there is one other disadvantage of the crystal oscillator, and that is that the crystal sits across two pins of the chip. So you're, you've got two less uh, GPIO pins to use for IO functions. Uh, what's the advantage of the resistor capacitor oscillator? Well, not much, really. Uh, you're using one I.O. pin to attach your resistor and your capacitor. Um, I suppose you could argue that um, you do have control over the speed of this by introducing perhaps some switched additional resistors or switched capacitors. You could conceivably uh, change the clock speed of the microcontroller by changing the capacitors connected to there. The big advantage of the internal 4 MHz oscillator is that you can calibrate it to reasonably exactly 4 MHz and you don't use any external pins so all the chip's I.O. pins can be used for, well, I.O. So I think that's answered uh, most of the questions that came up after part one of the assembly language tutorials. So what are we going to do in part two? Well, we're actually going to write some machine code and I'll explain much more about writing machine code and assembly language and how that's all done. And we're going to flash an LED. Well, of course we're going to flash an LED. What else would you do? For the moment, cheerio.